Great. Hi, my name is Oskar Velnichuk, and I'm the publisher of Aerosmith Press. Big thanks to James, the Grolier, and the Minkiti family for keeping things going here um, and really kind of creating a lively community uh, with their weekly events, their weekly readings. Uh, it's essential that we show our thanks by um, patronizing the vendors at the back here with all the kind of books by the tonight's, all tonight's featured writers. Um, yeah. But to have done instead of not doing, to have with decency not that a blunt should open, to have gathered from the air a live tradition, or from the final die, the unconquered flame, this is not vanity. Here error lies all in the not done, all in the diffidence that faltered. These lines from Pound's Peace and Cantos encapsulate the spirit of tonight's program. Um, I hope it's gonna be the first of a number of such events we do in collaboration with the Grolier, I'm telling you this now, James, um, <laughs> asking, now suggesting, in which we do indeed gather from the air live tradition and are quickened by the unconquered flame of our speakers, which our speakers have tended over the course of their lives. Um, Boston has been the center of so many extraordinary literary um, actions, uh, a place of such kind of great, brilliant ferment over the last half century. And what's the goal of this project is to create a dialogue, an intergenerational dialogue in which some of the writers who knew the writers who were here but are now gone can share their experiences with them and about them um, with an audience of younger writers um, and, and uh, um, keep this kind of uh, tradition and flame alive. Um, you know, because uh, I think for all our differences, um, I believe we all hunger for what one of Lowell's students called um, the dream of a common language. Hmm. I have to confess that when I arrived in Boston, I was not in the mood for Lowell, who <laughs> to me represented the poetry of memory as opposed to the poetry of the imagination. I was 21. What was memory to me? I deliberately missed my chance to hear him read in person. The following year, I did attend a memorial for him at which Elizabeth Bishop spoke. Nearly half a century later, as you might imagine, I have a rather different relationship to memory. In fact, one of the main reasons I came to Boston in the first place was to work with one of Lowell's students, George Starbuck. And so many of my friends and mentors here have been profoundly influenced by this poet of memory and by Elizabeth Bishop. And it wasn't long before I recognized what I had missed. Literature, as we all know, has its seasons, its fashions. Reputations rise and fall. But poetry is its own lodestone and force. And as Pound again said, literature is news that stays news. Here to bring you the news tonight um, is John Okrant. John Okrant is a poet and family doctor. His work has appeared in Plowshares, Plume, Poetry Northwest, Field, The Seattle Times, among other journals. He was chosen by Carl Phillips as the winner of the 2021 Jeff Marks Memorial Prize. Okrant works at a community health center in Tacoma, Washington, where he lives with his wife and two young children in a fisherman's cabin on Puget Sound. Please remember to, serve, to turn off your cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> that was an official reminder. <laughs> Arrowsmith published John's book, The Costly Season, in May uh, 2022. And as I understand it, the Poets Theater, another important Boston institution, will be turning that sequence, that cycle of poems about our terrible and costly season um, into a dramatic performance sometime this next year, I hear. So uh, I give you John Okrent, who will introduce our uh, evening's panelists. Um, all right, I'm gonna start with introductions and uh, hopefully Frank, wherever you are, you can, you can hear me. I'll have to be sort of speaking into the but, um, so, yes, I can. Okay, great. Um, so maybe, maybe you can speak up. A bit more. Do can you use the speakers? You know, if I use the microphone, then then they can't hear me on Zoom. But okay. I'll I'll project. I'll project. Megan Marshall 
first encountered Elizabeth Bishop in spring of 1975, when the poet appeared as a guest in a poetry workshop at Harvard taught by Robert Bull, in which Marshall, then a Bennington College dropout, was enrolled as a special student. Later, as a transfer student to Harvard Radcliffe, Marshall was lucky to gain admission to Bishop's last advanced verse writing class in the fall of 1976. Bishop lived only three more years, dying at 68 of a cerebral aneurysm in 1979. Marshall later wrote Elizabeth Bishop, A Miracle for Breakfast, a biography that intertwines Bishop's big screen life story with Marshall's own coming of age as a writer memoir. Lloyd Schwartz is a poet laureate of Somerville, Massachusetts, Frederick S. Troy Professor of English Emeritus at UMass Boston, longtime arts critic for NPR's Fresh Air and WBUR, and an editor of the poetry and prose of Elizabeth Bishop. His latest book is Who's On First? New and Selected Poems by University of Chicago Press. Frank Bernard is an American academic and poet and a winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry. He studied at Harvard where he was a student and friend of Robert Lowell and Elizabeth Bishop. And Martin Edmonds, Martin Edmonds' poems have appeared in Agni, The New Yorker, A Public Space, Paris Review, Little Star, The Nation, and are featured on the WB Yates Society of New York website. His book, Flame in the Stable, and chapbook, Black Ops, were published by Aerosmith Press. Donald Hall selected his first book, The High Road to Taos, for the National Poetry Series. The book has been anthologized by Ted Hughes, Seamus Haney, and his forthcoming in Poetry is Bread, the Arala Anthology. Honors include Artists in Residence, Cathedral of St. John the Divine, Massachusetts Cultural Council Artist Fellowship, Discovery, the Nation Prize, and Harvard's Lloyd McKim Garrison Medal for Poetry. You can read his essay, Rhyme and Reason, which we'll talk about tonight, I hope, focused on Bishop and Lowell online in Aerosmith Journal, Volume 21. So um, thank you all for being here and for being here on, on Zoom. And thanks to Askold and, and James for arranging this conversation. Uh, I feel very, very lucky and uh, out of my league to, to be up here with these wonderful writers um, talking about two of my favorite poets, uh, poets whose work I really love, two poets who really love each other. Um, as, Lowell and, as Lowell said to Bishop in one of their many letters, you have always been my favorite poet and favorite friend. <laughs> or in another, you and I are together till life's end. It feels fitting that we are bringing them together again tonight. Um, I wanted to address my first question to Frank to kind of bridge the gap in, in Zoom land and, and in the flesh. Um, so, so Frank, um, you are a dear close friend of both poets, often working alongside them, sharing and revising poems together. I read a letter in, in, in the letters between Lowell and Bishop in which he says, Frank and I revised 405 poems last month. <laughs> <It's impossible. laughs> um, and you also filled in for them teaching, often taking their places in their Harvard uh, poetry classes. And in Megan's biography, there's a scene in which she's reading her advanced verse writing class on the first day of class. And she says, I don't believe that poetry can be taught, but we'll do the best we can with the time we've got. And so my question is, what, what do you think she meant by that, that poetry can't be taught? And if not poetry, what did you all learn from these two amazing poets? Oh my. Uh... I mean, the answer, of course, is both everything and, and in a way, nothing. Um, uh, Bishop, I think, meant that you can't, you can't make a writer out of someone who's not a writer. And um, uh, she did not grow up in a world where uh, uh, one took poetry workshops or any kind of writing workshops. Um, and uh, her experience was the solitary maker, uh, and um, and at the end of her life, she needed uh, the income from teaching, and she liked to teach, 
I think in a way, um, she certainly liked to give advice, which she uh, <laughs> often talked about. And um, so uh, she taught and, and she was treated stupidly by, uh, by the English department at Harvard. And um, uh, I met her in, under the best circumstances possible. I had been Lowell's student and um, I had come to know him very well and look at his manuscripts and talk to him about poems he was writing. And he took my opinion seriously, which was a miracle. Um, and um, so then, then when he decided uh, to stay in England and to uh, live with uh, Carolyn Blackwood, he, um, uh, he wrote, he told me that he would write to Bishop and um, tell her to look me up. And he got Harvard to hire her uh, to replace him. And um, uh, so uh, he, and he did, he wrote to, um, to Bishop saying, you know, I'm there, I have a friend, Frank Bedard, and uh, uh, he will look you up. And then she wrote, he wrote to me saying, um, uh, uh, you must see, you must drop by and see Miss Bishop. And I knew her work, though not as nearly as well as I knew his work. Um, and, but I knew how good she was. And um, uh, I called her up and, um, uh, and she invited me over and we just got on very immediately. Uh, uh, I was completely candid about being gay and uh, uh, she, so the fact that I was straightforward about that made it easy for us to talk about both both of us were homosexual and um uh and i think she found it a relief to to talk to me about that and to and to have someone she could be candid about um uh and with um and um uh and and i continued to see Lowell's new manuscripts and um, and then that that made it natural for her when she had a new poem like the moose um to show it to me and um uh what i'm saying it look i'm a kid from bakersfield california i had had a wonderful education i was an undergraduate at the university of california at riverside I had been taught by uh, wonderful people like Tom Edwards. And um, when I came to Harvard in graduate school, I taught in Ruben Brower's Humanities Six course, which was a course in close reading. And um, so I had a, you know, I had had a, a very, a very good education. And in a way I was, I was prepared to speak the language that uh, Lowell certainly spoke uh, about about poems that were in the process of being written, and I love to look at things in manuscript, and um, and I knew it was an honor to do that. Uh, so um, uh, it it felt I had a kind of appetite for what. At, at that moment, he felt he needed. And the fact that Bishop uh, uh, then took me on as a reader um, had everything to do with, with Lowell having done that. And, um, uh, you know, I knew how privileged I was. 
uh, how how lucky and believably lucky I was. Um, you know, outside of Lowell and Bishop, I think my favorite living poet was Ezra Pound. And um, uh, uh, here I was, uh, as I said, a kid from Bakersfield, California, um, who, which is not a literary place. Um, I was a kid who was talking to two of the poets in the worlds that I most admired. And this was a kind of miracle. And I was seeing manuscripts that they were in the, the that that they were involved in and in working on. And um, uh, this was an unbelievable privilege. And I I can say honestly that I knew it was a privilege. And that um, I, you know, my self sense of self worth had a lot to do with the fact that they took me seriously. I'm curious whether, um, and this is for, for everybody, when sharing your work with them, was it, was it very different? The type you could show the same poem to each of them, and would, it, would you get completely different feedback, contradictory feedback? Or... But not really, though. Though uh, Bishop was more skeptical about some of the family candor of of, of some of my poems, um, uh, and and also, you know, she said she believed in closets, closets, and more closets. <laughs> she thought that people uh, that the world would make you suffer if you if you were candid about being gay. And um, she th thoroughly distrusted uh, academia. And um, uh, it, it, and she had, had the feeling that it may appear to be at the moment that academia has changed in terms of um, uh, accepting uh, a person being gay, but she didn't trust it. Um, so in that way, they were different. Um, uh, John, I, might I say, had a lot. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Pauline. Say something back to the question about uh, can writing be taught? And in, in my research, I came across this wonderful um, teaching observation that Elizabeth Bishop was asked to do for an MIT professor. If you're in the academic world, you know sometimes you have to go sit on a, in on other people's classes and report on them. And here was Elizabeth Bishop in December 1976 at the end of the very last class that she taught. Martin and I were in that class. She's asked to trot over to MIT and observe some somebody, Mrs. C, I won't tell you last name, <laughs> teaching her freshman writing class. And here's her teaching report, which sounds just like it begins on Monday, December 13th. I visited two classes of the MIT writing program. Anyway, um, but here's the kind of thing that she says that's so uh, quirky, so particular to her. To begin with, Mrs. C, let them do all the talking. She then asked a few questions and added some criticism of her own. Her manner was gentle and polite, perhaps a bit hesitant. And then here's the parentheses, the bishop parentheses. From my own experience, I think that the more polite the teacher, the more polite the students. <laughs> I've, I've attended classes in which the teacher was sarcastic or dismissive, and I think this has the effect of making the students overcritical, picky, and rude. There seems to be no sense in sarcasm and aggressiveness in the classroom. But a little bit later, she goes to the point that you asked about, I have never felt comfortable about teaching writing. She puts in quotations. I have never felt comfortable about teaching writing, group reading, group discussion, all this going over and over and over usually strikes me as a wasteful form of time passing or therapy with little or no connection to writing. However, it is true that some students do learn a lot in writing classes and that their writing does improve. I felt that the young men in Mrs. C's class were trying their hands at something they might never do again, and that the experience was probably very good for them. Um, 
they will produce better written scientific papers or letters to their wives. <laughs> or read a few good books a year, or at least feel respect for people who choose to spend their lives writing poetry or prose rather than working at more practical things. So I think maybe that speaks to your question. Uh, well, I one of the things that uh, that I um, that I discovered um, was a sheet of um, that oh, she yes. handed out to her her students, and this is it's dated 1975, and it says this is about, a, a, about her teaching. If you want to write well, she underlined <laughs> well. Always avoid these words. <laughs> and we've got, I won't read all of them. <laughs> this will, it's a long list. And potential, structure, lifestyle, birth experience, life experience, any kind of experience. <laughs> Creative and even more creativity. Um, more importantly, and hopefully, and she says in capital letters with an exclamation point, both wrong. <laughs> and then she writes in above between those two words, mostly. <laughs> and um, the one that has, uh, oh, communicate, meaningful relationship, cope as an intransitive verb, <laughs> and, and the one that has the most personal resonance to me, because I think I am responsible for her putting this phrase on her list, <laughs> is to have sex. <laughs> And I, one of the poems I showed her, I didn't show her a lot of poems. Lowell saw a lot of my poems in, in office hours. And, um, and it's sort of interesting that the poem that I'm gonna mention is the poem that Lowell thought was my best poem. And that Elizabeth didn't like really, well, she said, it's very, it was a, a kind of comic poem. And she said, it's very depressing, so it must be good. <laughs> and um, and um, the, the, this, the passage in the poem is, it's a dialogue and someone is saying, why do we have sex only when you want to? And the answer is, because you want to have sex all the time. <laughs> And, and, this is, and this is what she wrote to me about that. This is, it, 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 it's, it's, it's immortalized, it's in a letter. And I think it's kind of marvelous um, um, what she said. Um, oh yeah, here, well, well, perhaps because I am so utterly depressed by who's on first, maybe it is good after all. <laughs> One phrase I can't abide. It may be what everyone says at present, but it is all, but it always offends me. That is to have sex. Even Isherwood has used it. <laughs> if it isn't making love, what other way can it be put? I first heard it years ago when the famous fan dancer was talking about her pet snake. Maybe that prejudiced me. <laughs> it seems like such an ugly, generalized sort of expression for something, love, lust, or what have you, always unique and so much more complex than having sex. And I, you know, I think that's Bishop at, at her best as a teacher, but also in a way just teaching from her, in some ways, limited point of view. So I was find, trying to find anything I could about the class that I took and that Martin was in. And every time I read, she wrote about it in a letter, she kept saying things like, I have two really witty boys. 
and it was always these two really witty boys. I think maybe Martin was one of them. So maybe you could say something she about certainly your... never said that to me. What I what I remember is um, the period talk about being polite in the class, and that she was slightly delightfully formal. We called each other. She called us by our surnames. We called each other by surnames in the class. Um, her her rules were fewer. I mean, she didn't have a list of what not to use. Her rules were precisely two. If you used a word in a poem, you had to look it up. Um, she preferred, she said, the OED, the 13 volume, preferably the, the compact edition was fine. But if you didn't have that, Webb would do, but you know, Webster, not the World Wide Web. <laughs> but if you used the word twice, you had to look it up twice and read the entire entry both times. I mean, she just, you know, she said somewhere, um, there was a brief essay, I think she said, her favorite qualities in poems were spontaneity, <clears throat> accuracy, and mystery. And, and she, she talked about her favorite poets. And she said, not, not the best poets, but the people you were drawn, the, like your closest friends, your best friends. And um, it was Herbert and Hopkins. Is that right? Yes. Lee Hopkins and Coleridge. And she had, you know, a, she kind of parsed out who had which qualities of abundance. Um, and just certain moments in there in class of, um, you know, trying to find something that would please her. It was, it was hard always to come up with anything. But her, she talked about one line of, of Herbert, and I think it's from Easter, where he says, rise, heart, the Lord is risen. And you feel, I mean, just the way it embodies what it's saying of the sound that the rise feels that long eye feels calling there, right? It's, it's got that direction and it's, um, and it's lifting. Heart has that roundness. It feels like a weather balloon, but they're tethered to that full stop before the Lord is risen. And you feel that it's embodying. It, in fact, it's the, it feels like the rhythm of the second half, the Lord is risen, the rhythm of it, the lightness of it, is the leavening that lifts the heart. The heart, that column is the heart's in his throat. I mean, he's witnessing the resurrection. To him, seeing it reproduced in the service is the same as being present at the event. And for her, it was that how do you embody that? How do you get it into words? How do you make that real? Um, I was just going to mention that that wonderful quotation of hers is from an unfinished and unpublished essay that she wrote that begins, writing poetry is an unnatural act. <laughs> I think, and then she goes on, I think she says, so the, the, the job of the poet is to make it appear not just natural, but inevitable. And the only reasonable action to take under the circumstances. And of course, the poem is, has to provide, the poem becomes the circumstance of, of that, making it, making you naturalized in it. And, and probably the best question I've ever read from one of those author interviews, right? With Alexander Johnson, I think from the um, Christian Science Monitor, asked a surprising question because it was so direct of Elizabeth Bishop. She said, and I'm gonna get the phrasing wrong, but the gist of it was, what's, the, okay, spontaneity, accuracy, mystery, but what's the one quality every should have. And she said, surprise. It was the, the basic, I mean, why rehearse something? Why bother putting, writing a poem that you've already written or somebody else has addressed? But there was something had to have that element. I mean, I think of, I think it's Sunday, 4 a.m., where towards the end, it's the, the cat's gone a hunting, the brook feels for the stare. The world seldom changes, but a wet foot dangles until a bird arranges two notes at right angles. And there's something about that. The right angles feels like jazz. I mean, call, call Charlie, call Bird, you know? I, I, you feel like you would, you've got that entirely. And the other thing is the right angles. I mean, she's writing in quatrains. And if you unfold those four lines of each quatrain, it's the treads and the risers of the step, you know, the, the steps that the brook is climbing until the foot's wet and you got there. But there's, she did that consistently and quietly, right? I mean, 
I, she's as visionary as Blake, but she does it. I mean, her words for it are, it's like the country cousins of visionary. It's just, it's not vision, it's a look or a view. And she's got that all the time in her, her poems about painting. She always returns, you know, I, I know the place, right? I've seen, I, I know that view. But it, go ahead. No, it's just that sense also she was saying, and, and again, you know, reading Colbert, reading the Biographia Literaria and saying, He's talking about Wordsworth. He says, well, you know, the older generation, and again, I'm going to get the words wrong, but he said they used, or Wordsworth, he was talking about he generalized, and he said they used the plainest words to express the most fantastical thoughts. You know, our younger poets use the most fantastical words, words for very prosaic thoughts, right? And I think she would have agreed with that entirely. Yeah. There's, a, there's a passage in your essay um, for Aerosmith Journal, to bring Lowell back in a little bit. Um, and in this, we're talking about what a visual poet she is and how she prized accuracy and how her poems really made you see. Um, and you say in the essay that she was in line with Conrad who said that the aim in writing is before all to make you see. Um, and Randall, Randall Jarrell said about Bishop that every one of her poems was marked by the conviction, I have seen it. Um, but then Lowell kind of, on the other hand, um, in, the, in her introduction to the new selected poems of Robert Lowell, Katie Peterson, the poet, says that his work radiates with the vaguer, vaguer credibility, I have felt it. So you have the poem of, the poet of I have seen it and the poet of I have felt it. Um, um, do, you, do you agree with that? Do you, th do you think that, that, that they... That, that, that that's a true dichotomy that one of them I think aware. they both felt it and that the I have seen it is certainly true but that Jarrell doesn't go far enough and that um at the same time that that I think that review that Jarrell review was a review of Elizabeth's first book and Lowell also wrote a review of that book and he does go further. And that's an extraordinary review. And I think when everyone else was saying, oh, she has such an eye, she has, you know, she she's wonderful details in her poems. And Lowell is seeing a larger picture from just from her first book. And I think and it was before they met. And I think that having written that review, Lowell, Lowell became, it became possible for him to be her friend. And she was very careful about her friends. I mean, she was a very friendly person, but she was very careful about who, who she loved. She loved Frank, uh, for example. Um, but that she trusted Lowell because even before they knew each other, he had got, he had seen this deeper and larger element to her work than anyone else was, even Jarrell, who was so smart, that anyone else was, was seeing. I mean, it seems like maybe the seeing versus feeling is borne out also with their, with Lowell's reputation as the confessional poet, right. like the, the progenitor of confessional poetry. Um, but there's a, there's a passage, and I think it's in the book, or, or it was in your class, Megan, where she, Lowell is teaching um, in the waiting room, and he says at one point, it's a confessional poem, and then he corrects himself and says, oh, no, that's a bad word. It's a personal <laughs> poem. Yeah. Um, so I think, well, I think, I think that's uh, maybe what the, oh, the term that they shared of something they were seeking was was real. That came up often in the letter. This was a he, you were you were writing real poems at last, I, and and that was a word that came back and forth. And I don't know whether Frank has a sense of what real might mean, or any of you want to speak to that. I, I was just let me yeah. make one more point because for so many years her her most famous poem was the fish, mm. and it's got incredibly wonderful and detailed and surprising descriptions in it. The moment in the poem that for me becomes the profound Elizabeth Bishop moment 
is she talks about the fish with the, with the fish hooks hanging from his aching jaw. And that that's not visual, that's feeling, yeah. and that she is identifying with the pain of the fish. Yeah. And I think if it's a, I mean, it's a great poem, would be a great poem anyway, but that it's a whole other level than just that she was a wonderful descriptive writer. Do you think, and maybe Frank, you can speak to this, did, did Lowell, did they help each other in that way? And you know, there's the famous story of the, the armadillo, Bishop's poem, the armadillo inspiring Lowell's the skunk hour, skunk hour, and they were they were sharing their work constantly. Um, do you, did they did they help each other to to become more vivid or more feeling? Well, I think it was complicated. One must not sentimentalize them. Uh, Lloyd also knew both of them uh, in the last years of, of uh, his life. And, uh, you know, there, were, there was tension between them. Um, uh, so I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't think at a given point, uh, it, they would necessarily have agreed on whether a detail was right. Um, uh, return to can you can you back go back to the question initially? Well, we were, I mean, been... we're sort of just talking about the the difference between kind of this distinction between seeing and feeling or. Or maybe it's better to talk about uh, confessional poetry versus what he he corrected himself and called it a, a personal poem. I do. Right. I think that Bishop is an incredibly personal poet. She's not a confessional poet. I think that's exactly right. I know, but per personally, I think one art is a confessional poem because it's a poem she wrote when she was in the throes of a great crisis in her life. And the poem is very directly about that crisis. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I certainly never said to her, um, but Elizabeth, this is a confessional poem. Uh, and I don't, I don't know what she would have said. Uh, I know the first time Octavio Paz saw it, he turned to me and said, this is a confessional poem. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, uh, and, you know, and he said it, you know, what, knowing that she would not like his saying it. Um, you feel like she wrote more confessional poems as she, as she progressed, or is that a sort of a standalone? I think of it as being standalone because it was, it was really written in, in, in the crisis of that, of that moment. Alice was leaving her and she couldn't stand it. And she well, in the way was incredibly upset about it. But also and, early on, insomnia also. I mean, she doesn't wear her heart on the sleeve on her sleeve, but it, the reserve makes it more devastating when she gets there. Oh, I I agree that there, there, there are poems in that in that section of, of that book that are um very heart on the sleeve and uh, uh, to, in, to my mind one of the great virtues of Elizabeth is that she did not actually give a damn about consistency <laughs> <laughs> you know she she talked in as you as people have pointed out she talked a lot about accuracy etc and yet people have looked up that issue of um, uh, um, National Geographic, and, and uh, you know, it, it, it's not it's not at all what she could have seen at that moment when she was seven. Uh, the fact is, she uh, she created a fiction which corresponded to what she 
wanted to talk about. And uh, 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 and and accuracy be damned. There was also also what what happened after her death was that all these drafts and and finished poems right. uh, turned up in her notebooks and and papers that were very explicit and very personal and confessional uh, and um, really some extraordinary poems that she didn't publish and things that were finished that, you know, that I think she just felt, you know, that she, that she couldn't publish or that would be somehow not right for her to publish. And, um, but she wrote them. Can, can you, Lloyd, tell the story of seeing her, her uh, good, good morning, yeah, breakfast, breakfast, breakfast song? song. Yeah. yeah, well, I would love to. Um, I was, um, we, we really became friends. I had known her for several years. Frank introduced us after her, her very first reading she gave at Harvard when, when she uh, was teaching at Harvard. And we knew, knew each other and met, but we really became friends, I think, when I was visiting her in the hospital and it was over a Christmas vacation. And she knew that none of her other friends were in town. And she knew that I was going to be because we had both complained about this. And she asked me to um, bring, she had fallen down a flight of stairs and broken her shoulder. And she was in the infirmary at Harvard. And she had asked me to go to her apartment, which was a couple of blocks away. She was still living in Harvard Square. And to bring her her handbag and her notebook which I did. And um, I ended up spending the whole day talking to her. And she didn't like to talk about poetry. And it was the only thing I felt I had to talk to her about was her own poetry. But suddenly we were in a situation where we could gossip and talk about our friends, our mutual friends, Frank <laughs> being one of them. and. Um, records and movies and all sorts of stuff that I was, anyway, I was spending the whole day with her. And then I did that for the next three or four days that she was in the hospital. And I just visited her for the whole days. And they, it was great. Uh, and to break down that sort of coolness. Um, was, at any rate, at one point she was, um, taken out of the out of her room to get an x-ray or something and I was sitting alone in her hospital room with her notebook <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't resist and I opened it and there was this poem that was almost finished with a, just a few sort of penciled in changes, she switched a word around, you know, the placement of a word around. And I was totally floored by this poem. And it was a love poem. And it was a love poem to Alice Meffessel about whom one art was, was written. And I, I knew that. And I had to have a copy of the poem. I wasn't going to show it to anyone. I wasn't going to publish it. I wasn't going to do anything with it, but I had to have a copy. And I copied it. <laughs> Are you that, what made you think that she wouldn't publish that one? Were you sure that that was? I, just... No, I had hoped that she would publish it because yeah. I thought it was a great poem. And I was also afraid that she might not publish it. And that not only that, I was afraid that she might destroy it. And uh, let me read it. I mean, it's not very long. And, and uh, 
you I think you'll you you'll see what I you'll see what I mean. Um, I have no, I haven't. Uh, a breakfast song. My love, my saving grace, your eyes are awfully blue. I kiss your funny face, your coffee flavored mouth. Last night, I slept with you. Today, I love you so. How can I bear to go as soon I must, I know, to bed with ugly death in that cold, filthy place to sleep there without you, without the easy breath and night-long, limb-long warmth I've grown accustomed to. Nobody wants to die. Tell me it is a lie. But no, I know it's true. It's just the common case. There's nothing one can do. My love, my saving grace, your eyes are awfully blue, early and instant blue. I mean, how could I not <laughs> want to keep that on? And, um, and I waited 20 years, hoping that it would turn, never even turned up among her, her papers. Yeah. And finally, um, I sent it to Robert Giroux, who was planning a new edition of the new poems. And I sent it to Alice Methessel. And Alice wrote back, oh, that poem. <laughs> so I was relieved that she knew it, but it didn't turn up among her papers either. Yeah. And as far as I know, I had the only draft of that poem. Wow. I mean, it's, I've, I've been wanting to, I'm really sure that we talk about revision a little bit. And I think that leads naturally into okay. it. Because, um, she famously would revise and revise and leave poems unfinished um, for years, waiting for the right word. And Lowell obviously was revising all the time as well, but he published, you know, scores and so much, so many more poems than she did. I think she only published 100 poems. Right. Um, there's a really beautiful line in her elegy to Lowell um, called North Haven. There's, there's a couple, I want to just read a couple of the lines that, that get to this. She writes, the white, throat, the, the white throated sparrow's five note song, pleading and pleading, brings tears to the eyes. Nature repeats itself, repeats herself, or almost does. Repeat, 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 revise, revise, revise. And then, in the poem's last lines addressing Lowell, she says, and now you've left for good. You can't derange or rearrange your poems again, but the sparrows can their song. The words won't change again. Sad friend, you cannot change. And then in Lowell's poem for Elizabeth Bishop, number four, he writes, do you still hang your words in air? 10 years unfinished glued to your notice board with gaps or empties for the unimaginable phrase, the unerring <coughs> muse who makes the casual perfect. And then there, there's a quote I think in, in, in Megan's book in which Lowell says of Bishop, she always knows when a poem is done. Uh, and I'm curious whether they taught that. Can that be taught? Can you can you? How do you, how well, do you know when a poem is We're talking about two very different kinds of revision, yeah. which is the bishop revise, revise until it's perfect or it suits revise. her, and that's the end. Mm -hmm. And then there's Lowell, who was revising poems after publication yeah. and changing and changing, which I think is a process that Frank was involved in. So um, can that be I mean, even those are two different sort of disciplines um, uh, uh, about the... Uh, but many writing writers and many writing professors will say it's the revision that's the fun part. Mm -hmm. Then you feel that you're 
You're making you're making the thing. I, I feel that way. Megan, you probably yeah. remember from class. I mean, there was because she she was absent often, it seemed, and Frank was like to have take her place. Um, I, I remember getting the impression that she was making her dental appointments for class time. <laughs> I thought she preferred having her teeth drilled or being, you know, stuck with a needle and numb to actually dealing with our poems some of the time. But when she was there, um, she also, she didn't like to talk about writing that much. I mean, and sometimes occasionally, and this, this was wonderful because we advanced quickly, you, you know, the, the student paper on top, and she, da -da, that one scans, <laughs> you know, on to the next. <laughs> <laughs> but so when we got through the student poems, she would just talk off the cuff. And it was the most incredible conversation. I mean, she knew things about, we were young, right? But she knew things about the world. And something that's in her poems, they know things about the world. There's, there's nothing in her, there's nothing in writing that she liked, I think, that wasn't related to something else. I mean, nothing there just for the sound. It had to be true to life, or what was the point? And partly, um, she, you know, she almost never talked about it. And sometimes, and the other way in a poem, she'd read something, and it's very polite, right? Um, what does bathosphere mean, Mr. N? Or, or do you know the meaning of the word caterwaul, Mr. Edmonds? <laughs> I remember that one for some reason, right? But then what else did she need? What else did anyone need to say after that, right? But one day, she and this, I only remember it happening once. I don't think I missed the class, but she mentioned, she talked about writing Crusoe in England. And she said she got to a certain point and she's describing this one Billy Goat and he comes up and he's standing on the little volcano. And she said, you know, which I call Mont Despair or Mount Despair. She said, I had time enough to play with names, right? Um, but she's staring at his face or staring over Crusoe's shoulder at his face. And she realizes she doesn't remember which way a goat's pupils go. And she had a friend, a writer, I think a prose writer who lived in fiction, I don't know his stories and novels, but who lived in, you, you, maybe you know who it was, Connecticut or Rhode Island. Either he kept a string of goats or he had neighbor, a neighbor who had goats. She called him and it was, it was horrible weather. She called him up and asked him if he would go out and look. <laughs> and he said, well, um, I think he was a little afraid of getting drenched. He said, well, why, why don't you read me the lines that are giving you such trouble? So she read them, and, and I checked just to find out um, Dean Rogers at Vassar Special Collections, and they've got 21 pages of manuscript from that poem. So as she read it to him, um, anyway, she reads it to him, and, he, and um, she says, you know, his, his silence on the line, and then he says, Elizabeth, those, the lines are so lovely. Why don't you just keep them the way they are? Um, and evidently, she did prevail upon him. He went out when, when it was published. <laughs> um, so the line, as I recall, and this was, you know, the line she had was, those, pu those perpendicular pupils told me nothing. And when she revised, so she says, he says, why don't you just publish it the way it is? It's gorgeous. And she said to us, and, you know, we're, we're all so happy for her. Do you remember that? I mean, we're staring at each other and smiling, kind of reflecting glory at the, the love. They're so lovely. And she says, I guess that's the difference between fiction and poetry. <laughs> you know? So when the line, when the, poem came, when the poem came out, Crusoe in England came out, in Geography 3, the lines were, his pupils horizontal narrowed up and expressed nothing except a little malice, <laughs> right? But clearly she checked it had to be right. There was no way she was going to sign off on something that just wasn't true to the world. Another story that she told in that sort of, once the poems were passed and she had to fill the time um, involved Marianne, <laughs> Marianne Moore. Um, and this was, I, I found out later as I was working on the book that she was working on her memoir of Marianne Moore at the time which she, um, I don't believe, I think she read from it. I don't know if she published it during her lifetime, but she was still bearing a grudge over this line that was her line, Elizabeth Bishop's oh. line. Um, uh, she had, I guess in the, when was it? The 1930s, early in her friendship with Marion Moore, Bishop had gone out to Cape Cod and reported uh, back to 
more that she'd seen in the lobby of the hotel, the bellboy with the buoy balls, um, those little glass <laughs> balls in, in the net. And she had been proud of this line. And then wouldn't you know, Marion Moore had put this in a poem, the bellboy <laughs> with the buoy balls without asking her first. And um, she was- That happened to her this. a lot. Yes, it happened to her other times. So um, I still, uh, that line of course stayed, stayed with me. Um, and she never got to use it. She had to let Marion have it. Um, so we're, we're a little over an hour and I think we wanted to open it up to questions from the audience. But um, I, I, I was curious whether any of you or Frank um, have a, a, a particular poem of either of the poets. Um, I know that, I don't know if it was, I, I think when he died or yeah. forget where the story came from, but Lowell, I guess always carried a poem of Bishop's different poems in his wallet as sort of talisman. Um, but I wonder if, if, if you have poems yeah. that you, you feel that way about. I'd like to read one of Lowell's poems because I just want to call to us here the presence of Scott Harney, my late partner who was in the Lowell class with me in 1975. And, and um, his book of poems was published by Arrowsmith and is, is there for people to read and purchase to support Arrow, uh, for support Grolier. Um, but this is a poem that Scott loved to quote um, to me, parts of it. And um, it's called Obit, which I'm sure many of you know this poem, which is at the very uh, end of, for, Lizzie and Harriet, um, and it's about an obituary for his marriage to Elizabeth Hardwick, but it, it also is a, a mourning poem in another way. So, obit. Our love will not come back on fortune's wheel. In the end, it gets us. Though a man know what he'd have, old cars, old money, old undebased pre-linden silver, no copper rubbing through. Old wives, I could live such a too long time with mine. In the end, every hypochondriac is his own prophet. <laughs> Before the final coming to rest comes the rest of all transcendence in a mode of being, hushing all becoming. I'm for and with myself in my otherness in the eternal return of earth's fairer children the lily, the rose, the sun on brick at dusk, the loved, the lover, and their fear of life, their unconquered flux, insensate oneness, painful it was. After loving you so much, can I forget you for eternity and have no other choice? I know Bishop loved that poem. She she mentions that last line and says that it was she couldn't have said it any better. Uh, you know, <laughs> she had been trying to express, "I've loved you. How can I? What, what can you read that one last?" Yeah. Time? Um, after loving you so much, can I forget you for eternity and have no other choice? I think you know partly mainly because of the early poems and and certainly the complications of notebook um, and, and those volume, five volumes or whatever, and some of them reissued and rewritten. And um, but there was such a great simplicity in the heart of writing at the same time. I mean, for all, for all his memory, you know, um, he said, you know, genius is memory, right? But then there was there was also invention we haven't mentioned. The two of them were in, in just brilliant prose writers as well. I mean, they're you know the the, the pieces what the unbalanced were in, either in the village. And some of that. I mean, there there's one line describing the horse in there that she's got about a and this is a horse being shot, right? Um, a cloud of his odor is a chariot in, in itself. It's, in, if you found that in the Bible, you would believe it. Who wrote But that, I mean, in day by day, especially at the end, it felt like, I mean, after those notebooks and the blank sonnets, it felt like such a bursting out of bonds for him. You know, we we're somewhere else, the rhythms are different, um, something else is going on. And if part of it, and I think of 
there was all these poems with just just animals in the countryside wandering through. He's you know it's he's it's, it's just the daylight that's attracting his attention in a way. And you feel this fellowship with all of those animals, right? It's any suffering being that he's open to. There is, I mean, he, he, he's got that. And you feel it in other poets too. Who, I mean, there's, there's such, they're so familiar with embodying ideas, um, <coughs> really whatever, in, and something that the senses can perceive. How else are you going to really get that across in a poem? I mean, poems that are all in someone's head, it feels like hearsay to me when I'm reading the poem, but if there's something that's there and then embodied in the sound of the words, the textures of it, they're on the line, whatever. But there's this incredible negative capability. I mean, of just, it feels like Lear at the end, you know, of talking to Cordelia, but, you know, we'll be God's spies and, you know, get into the, the mystery of things, right? So he's, there are all these animals that, you know, fly, crawl, swim, trot, waddle through all those poems. But there's this feeling in, in that, in Ovid, the thing that's so amazing to me, I mean, given his history and the breakdowns and places, you know, where he was and that sense of being divided, having this other self that takes over, um, being compassionate to it, how do you how do you how do you get up and carry on? The exhaustion you've caused others, the exhaustion you caused yourself. Um, but when he says, "I'm for and with myself and my otherness," and you feel like knowing that was what opened him to, you know, to that, just what shared creaturely with other people, with other, with uh, any living being. And it's it's rare, but it, it can be so delicate. I mean, he from early on, from like in that falling asleep over it, the Aeneid. I mean, you feel that description of, you know, dreaming he's Aeneas and looking at Pallas, you know, dead. Um, it's the writing, it, you know, it's electric and tender as, a, as an open wound or as a lover. I mean, there's both of that. It's, it's all there and so confrontational of the flesh, but the spirit that's born behind it. There's a gentleness that's there. I mean, I think of the, the great violence of, you know, I'm um, certain Quaker graveyard, it, it's there, but it's balanced by something else. Um, and it's hard to remember sometimes, but there's that, you know, just, oh, it is transcendent that way. It truly is, you know, just reaching that spot. I agree with you. I think that's wonderful, wonderful about Lowell's work. Frank, is there a poem that, that that you'd like to read, talk about why or? No, no but I, there's one thing I wanted to say that there, you know, Elizabeth was very um, uh, wary of, of of readers and um uh the uh and uh, we, you know we would argue about things and one of the things we argued about over and over again was the role of candor and um and this was connected to the issue of of confessional uh, of, of being confessional and the degree to which one wrote about negative things in one's own life and, and, and family. And um, uh, the, uh, uh, she read near the end of her life, she, she gave a reading at Wellesley and um, uh, Lloyd was there, and it was one of the best readings she ever gave. In my opinion, the best reading I ever heard her give. And um, and I introduced her that night, and um, I talked about about the um, uh, the negative in Bishop's work, and how you know the the people. Um, uh, Many people had wanted to turn her into something that was sentimental and um, 
uh, and positive, and um, that 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 was not really that was not true of the poems. It was not true of her work. And she read af and after that introduction, she read uh, uh, many poems in which in which the negative was embodied. And um, it was really one of the best readings. It was perhaps the best reading I ever heard her give. And um, I wanted to record it. And, um, uh, and before the reading, she refused. She thought of herself as not a good reader. And she could not be a good reader but she could also be a wonderful reader. And um, uh, that night I bowed to her will and she said, no, I could not record it. And um, though it would have been easy to record it because there, it, she did speak into a mic and that mic was um, fed through a sound system that could have made a, a, a record of it. And uh, she wouldn't let me do it. And I regret that because I think it's it's the best single reading I ever give. And um, the reason that you now can't hear that reading is that I bowed to her will and I and she wouldn't let me do it. And I said, OK, we won't record it. And I should have lied to her. I should have said to her, <laughs> we're not going to record it. And and, and told the sound guy to record it. And um, uh, I regret that. And I, I think Lo, uh, I think Lloyd would, would second what I'm saying. He was there that night. I, I, I've oh, thought back to that reading and thought maybe one of the re reasons it was such a great reading was that she knew it was not going to be recorded. Mm -hmm. I mean, which doesn't mean it shouldn't have been recorded. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and her recordings, I mean, her readings were often better than her recordings. Wouldn't take much. Um, but she, she was a very stiff reader. But sometimes that sort of... I don't know. Remember the Invisible Shield commercials for, for, for toothpaste? And sometimes that Invisible Shield would just dissolve. And it did at that reading at Wellesley. She also read great poems. They, they were the poems out of, mainly poems out of uh, Geography 3, I, I, as I recall. And, and Megan was in the room when she read One Art for the first time, I think, Frank. Well, not for Frank's? the first time, but she did. She, she, the book had been published, but oh, it was, okay. uh, people wanted her to read it because it was such a great poem at that party. But I've often wondered whether, you know, the, the voice in the poems is so powerful and she must have had that voice in her head as she was writing them. She must have been writing or, or not. I don't know. When, when you write a poem, are you hearing a voice, your inner voice? And it, so it's a, to me a conundrum that must have had the voice in her head, but it doesn't come out when she speaks the poem. Um, in public, I guess, that's the difference. I wanted to add one thing. This is a, a little, a little out, of, out of order, um, but I think something that was, that's real, and that struck me as really profound. Um, one of the things that turned up after her death, and actually not so long ago, were these very long letters that she wrote in 1947 to her psychiatrist. And the letters are mostly about sexual issues. And a number of the people, a number of people who have been writing about it have really focused on all of these quite graphic confessional things that she was writing to her, to her psychiatrist. They're fascinating letters. But there's one moment that seems to me a real revelation about Bishop as a writer. 
And she's talking about, this was just after she had written one of her masterpieces um, at the fish houses. And she says, she, well, she had, she was a little bit drunk and she was riding on her on a bicycle through, through Nova Scotia. She was visiting her aunt or her family. And that she sat down on a rock and then the seal came out of the water and the seal is in the poem, it's in, at the fish houses. And then she just goes, this passes by in this letter very quickly, but she says, and then I saw the poem. And I think, you know, that these poems that took her 20 years to write or to finish, or that took her 10 days to write, like one art, um, or that she wrote faster or slower. I think the poem was completely in her head and that I saw the poem, that she saw it and that, and maybe she didn't always see the poem and those were the poems that she couldn't finish and that she never published. And I'm not sure about. about well, one of those letters is also about the bus ride where the moose comes out. And um, she's has, she wrote about that to Marianne Moore, but she also wrote about it to the psychiatrist, the psychoanalyst, um, right. and right. says she hears these voices in the back, and one of them is the analyst's voice in that version of it. But, but I, I think one of her uncanny, one of the uncanny things about Bishop is that she saw the poem. And um, you have and, a question? Sorry. And, oh, no. and, and I'm just, I'm yeah, just, right. I'm just, and, and that maybe that's very different from Lowell. Mm -hmm. That Lowell is in the, always in the process of discovering what the, what the poem is going to be, or often in the process of discovering. Um, anyway. I was just going to add, uh, in those Foster letters, there's also a wonderful passage in which she talks about realizing that all of her work is one thing yeah. and that she's writing one long poem and it's interesting because it's also connected to visual art as well let, let, let me just say that heather tressler who just spoke is the one person who has written about those letters that is really great you have a wonderful <laughs> essay on on those letters and you really treat them and you treat Bishop as, as an artist and not just as someone talking about her sex life. Thank you. I wanted to circle back if, if I could, and I don't wanna come into the conversation, but I wanted to um, make note of something that's in the archive that I think um, suggests not only what she gave to her students, but also what her students gave back to her. Um, and as much as there's this wonderful letter from Frank uh, to Elizabeth, describing his experience of reading in the waiting room for the first time and reading it in what sounds like a fast food restaurant in I think Berkeley, California, a restaurant called um, the Hermit Hamburger. And <laughs> Frank writes to Bishop that um, how extraordinary it is to be reading this poem in the Hermit Hamburger. And it's, it's a poem he knows that he'll be living with living with the poem for the rest of his life. And that in the poem, the child narrator um, asks, among other things, how is it I came to be this person? How is it that I am an I? And in the poem, or rather in the letter, uh, Lloyd, that you published in um, the Library of America edition, we get Bishop's response to Frank. And she both thanks him for sort of recognizing what's in the poem. And then in a very sort of sweet maternal way, she says, now what's with this hermit hamburger? <laughs> Is everyone eating their own hamburger in, in a solitary booth? <laughs> and then I think, Frank, she says something like, are you getting out enough? You know? 
<laughs> I have some friends in California you should look up. Um, but it's wonderful in those letters to see, I think, um, Frank, what, what really, what your commentary on that poem um, and the recognition that you gave her of what that poem does, what it sort of gave to her. Um, and of course, as tertiary readers, we can sort of receive, receive that gift as well. But it suggests, I think, how much she got from, from the two of you and from, from all of her better students. I just have to say that the first time I encountered in the waiting room, I was in a phone booth in a parking lot in Santa Fe. <laughs> and I was on the phone with Frank, and Frank said, have you seen The New Yorker this week? There's a new poem by Elizabeth. And I hadn't seen it. And Frank read it to me. And I am in this. Remember what a phone booth is? <laughs> I'm in a phone booth in a parking lot in Santa Fe. And I am just dissolved in tears listening to this yeah. masterpiece. Um, and I was Frank yeah, reading I it. To say one sorry. more thing about that poem, because as we were talking about it earlier, I'm realizing you're talking about it at the time that it was published. But in, I don't think, I doubt I was the first person to figure this out, but she really was writing or wrote much of the poem while Lotta was still alive. She was in New York City and she sends it to Lotta who says, who likes this poem. So yes, she was writing it in a moment of crisis, in two, two moments of crises, mm. the crisis over Lada when they were separated, and then I guess finished it um, and published it in the 70s, in the mid 70s, 10 years later, um, in perhaps, you know, when things were difficult with Alice. I don't know. When was, the, she also wrote a short story called The Country Mouse, an autobiographical short story that she never published, which has a lot of the same plot line as in the way. Yes, room. I think she wrote that when, when she was writing um, in the village, but she just didn't publish it. Yeah. Um, so that, and, that was long. Before. And the poem is better. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very interesting story. And I just have to say, one of the very few times that I was ever in the company of both Lowell and Bishop, and I, was at a birthday party at Frank's apartment for Lowell. And Lowell and Bishop were comparing hilarious stories about their dentists. <laughs> and I wish I could quote what they were saying because we didn't write things down in those days. But they were, each one was topping the other with, you think that's funny. <laughs> Let me tell you about this. <clears throat> Go ahead. I tell you about this birthday party because it came up in my research too. And I'm, I'm working at it through the archives and I'm looking at her date books and it says March 1 or, or whatever it is, you know, Cal's birthday, lamb. <laughs> so I thought, well, did she give a dinner? Did she feed him lamb? I was about to write that in the book when I happened to chat with Jean Strauss, who was around. And she said, yeah, I remember going to one of his birthday parties and Elizabeth brought him a stuffed lamb. I mean, a little lamb toy. Um, because it, it was supposed to represent March coming in like a lamb rather than a lion. And now, 50 years later, I was at my Harvard reunion a year ago, um, and um, we were talking about Lowell and Bishop, and somebody said, well, Robert Lowell was pretty strange, wasn't he? I, I saw him once, you know, going through the dorm, and he was, like, clutching his stuffed rabbit. <laughs> well, you know, there's a story to that. Was, was this the rabbit party? Frank probably remembers the rabbit Yeah, it party. must have been. Yeah, yeah must Because have been. they weren't always to, all that often together in Cambridge at the same time. I mean, what, you know, one of the, one of the details that makes me think that the character of, um, um, in, in the group. Mary McCarthy. Lakey. 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 Yeah. Uh, the character of Lakey in the, in the book, uh, which both Mary McCarthy and Elizabeth absolutely denied was about Elizabeth. But one of the details is that Lakey is someone who always gives people the perfect 
presence. Mm -hmm. And that was Elizabeth. Well, Roxanne told me that Elizabeth said she was late to Roxanne. They went to see the movie together so that they could see uh, Elizabeth, wow. represented by Candace Bergen. Yeah. Played by Candace Bergen. So anyway. So yeah, so no, of course they they both <laughs> they both had to know. Yes. Yeah. But um, but she wouldn't have said that to uh, right. no, no, no. deny, deny. Right, deny, deny. Revise, revise. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe time for two more questions from the audience. Yeah. Please. Or from the Zoom audience. I don't know if that's possible. Don't you want to know anything <laughs> <laughs> more than we've told you? Speaking of movies, there's a passage in the very end of your book where Elizabeth Bishop sees a screening of Star Wars, which blew my mind. <laughs> Elizabeth Bishop watching Star Wars. Just... Well, well, also, I now I know you take I'm not sure that Amram Shapiro knows everything or is all that reliable. I think he is. Anyway, he said that she liked Terminator. <laughs> is it Terminator or the no? Sorry, the Hulk is the Hulk. <laughs> the Hulk. I'd like to see the Hulk. That I, that I had. Yes. So, yes. so <laughs> what would you want poets nowadays? Like, you haven't had the opportunity to interact with them and learn from them. What would you want them to take away or to remember about these poets or maybe keep alive about these poets? Their poems. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, accuracy, spontaneity, and mystery. Mm -hmm. And in both of them, and just the depth of feeling in the, go the gorgeous surface and the depth of feeling and the real passion, even, I mean, Maybe this is, it, it seems deceptive on the part in a way, but the real passion to, oh, I don't know, to use a word she wouldn't, Elizabeth Bishop wouldn't like, but, but to communicate real feeling and real ideas. And they are, I mean, in their different ways, they are such amazing role models for, for, for any writer. Um, I think that both say memorize one poem by each and just carry that around. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yes. What do you think was the essential draw between them? What do you think the essence was? They seem so different in some ways. They, lo they loved each other's work even before they knew each other. And and loved and respected it. Understood. And understood it. Yeah. Hmm. I was also thinking, you know, we were, this is Lowell and Bishop in Cambridge, um, how they both began in this part of the world. They, you know, Elizabeth in Worcester and Lowell in Boston, and they both hated it, you know, <laughs> they wanted to get away. <laughs> and yet here they came back again um that's another kind of a puzzle um yeah. especially elizabeth who who you know loved the wider world so much well she moved from cambridge to an apartment you know on lewis wharf and she could look out at the, at the, the water boats, yeah. yeah the boats she kept her binoculars right near her window. I also, I want to add, make another point about, we were talking a little, well, Star Wars and the Hulk. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and, and Elizabeth loved popular culture and she loved popular music as well as the classics. And one, one of my favorite um, things about Elizabeth Bishop was and this was something that she told her class, that she thought the most perfect line of iambic pentameter in English was, I hate to see that evening sun go down. <laughs> and, you know, 
And that was her frame of reference also. She wrote poems that she hoped Billie Holiday would sing. And, um, well, and that she wasn't a snob. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've talked about her kind of reluctance to teach, but I believe it was a dream she had in a dream that she, you know, sent her students to Woolworth to pick out an object and mm -hmm. come back and write about it. So she, you know, she was thinking about it a great deal. She cared about it, even if it wasn't, it was an unnatural act <laughs> to teach for her. Yeah. Um, it seems to me, I, maybe I'm wrong, but it seems to me that Elizabeth Bishop's poems today are remembered more and taught more than Robert Lowell's. And I'm wondering, do you think that's true? And if so, why do you think that is? Fashion and criticism and who's teaching the classes and you know, Robert Lowell got into a lot of trouble because of, and, and Bishop really feared this when he wrote those poems that had letters from Elizabeth Hardwick in, in them. And fascinating that Bishop, when she wrote to Robert Lowell, uh, and she, she really feared for him. And then she said, you know, you shouldn't do this. Uh, you shouldn't write these letters, but if write these poems in, in the voice of Elizabeth Hardwick's letters. But if you're going to do it, you should be more accurate. <laughs> so, the, you know, it was two, two, she was sending two messages. But she also said in that in that letter to Lowell, art isn't worth that much. And Lowell didn't believe that. And I'm not sure she did either. But it, it may be partly that her, you know, the person, the poems are personal, but not so confessional, I guess. And so they're easier for many, many people to uh, identify with more, a bit more universal in some way. But um, I know nothing about the subject other than that I'm Martin's friend and have been subjected <laughs> to. <laughs> But well, I, was, you. I was, when I think about it, I think all of us have been wondering, you know, Lowell, hello, <laughs> where is he, uh, conspicuous by his absence today uh, in many, and I don't mean just here, uh, and I was struck by a line that I think, Lloyd, you read, uh, something about the wanting the real silver uh, not the silver plate where the copper shows through or whatever. Well, that was from the poem, the obit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Was was obit. So, yeah. Now, what, what strikes me about that is class. Hey. Right? And I think one of the reasons, perhaps, that Lowell is not of such interest to today's readers in today's fashion is not only that he... <laughs> a very elevated class, which he did, okay? He was a Lowell after all, and the Lowells and the Cabots become a God and all that jazz, right? Uh, but he was, he couldn't help it. It was his, uh, it was <coughs> with, that, um, with that sensibility that would think in terms of the silver, the good silver and the, and the cheap silver that would have the tarnish showing through. And that's something nobody can relate to today. Well, he's talking about the time when the quarters and the dimes started to have copper in them rather than um, it's not, although he's also making fun about, of the concept of old money. Um, yes, yeah. I mean, it's, so, you know, it's in that. Yeah. So, so I think just the fact that he, that he was uh, a Brahmin, a Boston Brahmin, uh, who, from, who hung out with a lot of other Boston Brahmins. But from the wrong side of Beacon Hill. <laughs> he was very aware of, of, of that. The nuances, right. Mm -hmm. but, well, there's no doubt that that has some element. Uh, and and it's, too, it's too bad because we read, we read, we read George Herbert and and, and um, uh, and Emily Dickinson and Whitman and Shakespeare, who you know don't necessarily relate, re relate 
And that's, you know, and I think that's one of the problems about, you know, the literary slash academic world and that we want that a lot of people want images that reflect their own image. And, and that's too bad. It's a limit. It seems to me it's a limitation to our imagination if we can't read something that isn't just an image of ourselves. Well, I completely agree. I was just making yeah. an observation. But I think you're right. I think I, I'm, I think you're right that that, that that element of class has has a, probably a lot to do with why Lowell isn't read so, as, so much these days. We, we forget that he was on the cover of Time magazine and he was the of his... And Elizabeth Bishop certainly felt neglect, comparatively neglect. Absolutely. Yeah, it just, I mean, it's the, one of the tensions. Even the thing about have, being interviewed for Paris Review, right? Just right. didn't happen. Why, why not? Yeah. So I think it's, re, you know, it's redressing that some way and it's fluctuation in taste. Well, you know, I, I added to the book on Elizabeth Bishop. And she was still alive, and she actually helped me with some stuff. In it. And um, nobody wanted to publish it. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, nobody wanted to publish it until after she died. Mm -hmm. Same book. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's still in print. Of course, that more people are reading it now, probably, than, than when it first came out. But suddenly, she became the poet of choice, the American poet of choice. And rightly so, but not always for the right reason. Well, and some of it had to do with the very quick, after her death, fairly soon publication of the letters. The people began to have a right. real passion for her and to know her. Yeah. Um, and that was a very good thing to do, and yeah. as opposed to, say, Adrian Rich, who's, you know, there and those letters are in the Schlesing. Not to compare Adrian Rich with Elizabeth Bishop, that's a whole other question, but just it's a whole say, other story. Yes, too. it's another it's story. And that next time, but um, you know, <laughs> if you sit on the letters, the, the life is is uh, less available. I think we can mingle for a while and continue talking. Yeah, yeah. this yeah. has been a conversation uh, and uh, a live tradition, really. Um, thank you so very much to our distinguished panelists, to Frank, wherever you are, to the audience here, to James, to Grover. It's too late for me to yeah, add one, one thing. Earlier by buying some books. <laughs> Many copies. <I> mean, <laughs> um, you guys, Frank wants to say something more. Well, is, is, is it too late? Uh, um, I, 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 I'm thinking about the fact that Askold started this. this <laughs> and but I just wanted to tell you that I I have three books. Frank, go ahead, Frank. Well, uh, I wanted to um, uh, talk about the fact that Askold started this evening, and in I can't remember now the year that it was uh, first published, but Askold's first novel was very much about being Ukrainian American. And the fact that because I read that book, it's a marvelous book, uh, I could have told Putin that it was not a good idea to invade Ukraine. Because <laughs> <laughs> the Ukrainians were gonna fight and, and their identity was not uh, uh, a uh, it was not something that that the Russians should toy with. And um, anyway, I, I'm very always been grateful for the fact that that uh, I felt I had an insight into the issues of any of the politics around Ukrainian issues 
because of Askell's really first rate, wonderful first novel. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Frank. Hi, Frank. I'll email you.